<laughs> okay, hey everybody, my name is Robert Ledbetter and I'm a perfusionist at UAB. I'm really impressed at how many people are still here. I was hoping it was going to be like the front row, so there's a lot more people here than I thought. Um, so if I get nervous, I apologize. Um, I'm supposed to do perfusion perspective, so I did. I, honey, I think someone shrunk the bypass circuit. Um, I thought it was really funny. Do I, do I, point, it at, I point it at this? Oh, okay, I have nothing to disclose. Um, I wish I did, I think that means I get paid money somewhere, but I don't, so if you want me to disclose something later, let me know. <laughs> I do have twins at home. Okay, so we're gonna talk about three things. We're gonna talk about our cannulas slash our circuits. We're gonna talk about labs, and we're also gonna talk about what happens when it hits the fan. So about me, I was, or is, or I was a nurse, I got a, bachelor's degree from the University of Southern Mississippi. There's a bunch of prestigious alumni from Southern Miss here. For those of you not from Mississippi, that is not Ole Miss or Mississippi State. And the movie The Blind Side was not filmed there either. Um, we do have Brett Favre. So for four years I worked at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital in their CVICU. Two of those years I spent as a bedside ECMO nurse. Um, I then went to perfusion school and now I'm a perfusionist here at UAB. Um, that's my wife, she's sitting over here. If y'all wanna meet her afterwards and take photos uh, with someone famous in a presentation, y'all can. We've got eight month old twins. Um, on the right is the boy, Collins, on the left is Kendall. Or, is that right, flipped it over? Flipped it, I did it wrong, it's cool. Uh, and then we have a dog, her name's Daphne. So uh, the, the big question and the reason why y'all are all still here is why should you care what a perfusionist thinks? Most people don't. Um, I was a nurse for four years. Two of those I was an ECMO nurse. Never met a perfusionist. Didn't know they existed. I overheard a, uh, another guy talking in the hallway and his, he was the manager of our ECMO program at the time and the doctor's talking to him and says, you know, you should really go look into perfusion school. And I was like, I wonder where he's gonna go. So I Googled perfusionist. Two years later, here I am. But what we are, as experts in the field of circuitry, cannulas, flow dynamics, blood conservation, and anticoagulation. We're a really good resource to have, and I bet if you have a heart program, you probably have a perfusionist somewhere. He might be in the office drinking coffee, but he's there still. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about circuitry. I tried to Google perfusion cartoons, and believe it or not, there's not that many out there, so if anybody here's an artist, Please work on some more perfusion cartoons. So I got a lot of heart surgery cartoons that we're gonna look at. I'm sure this happens all the time where the surgeon forgets which one's the good heart and which one's the bad heart. Um, so our bread and butter here at UAB for circuitry is the cardio help. It's got a lot of really good perks. It's got a lot of safety features. It has a nice battery life. It's bioline coated, so you don't have to use nearly as much heparin as you would on a non-coded circuit. One of my favorite things is it has a bubble detector with air intervention. Um, I can't tell you how many times that's probably saved a patient's life because something has happened, as Daniel said, and by the time you get in there and figure out what it is, if it didn't have that air intervention and stop the circuit, you'd probably have a corpse in front of you. So I went and looked at their IFU and they have a HLS set advanced 5.0, which is the max leaders. We use a 7.0, because here in Alabama, we go big or go home. Um, so they do have a 5.0 for those of you up from smaller states. Important things here are gas flows 15 liters a minute, which is great. We normally cap ours out around 10, but we could in theory put it to the wall and make it go higher for patients that need more sweep. Um, in addition to it, the surface area of 1.8 meters and the priming volume. Priming volume can be a little bit skeptical, we'll talk about that here in a second, um, but without all the tubing, it's around 300 cc's. The other guy that we use here at UAB is gonna be the Centromag. I think CardioHelp and Centromag are both outside, so y'all can go and hang out with them, but don't get all of your stuff signed because I wanna win whatever the echo thing is. Um, the Centromag is great, it's bearingless. It can last a very long time. Only thing that we don't really use about it is it doesn't really have an air detector. So we've kind of made one up, but it's not as air intervention safe as the cardio help. 
Big perks about this guy versus the cardio help is they're two separate things. So if we want to just change out the oxygenator, we can do it and we can save a lot more volume, especially on patients who have a low hematocrit that we don't want to give blood to, like a lung transplant person that doesn't need all those antibodies. So we'll put them on the Centromag with the Quadrox and just change out the Quadrox over and over and over and over again versus getting a whole new uh, cardio help circuit that's 600 cc's. I think the actually just the Quadrox oxygenator is maybe around 200, 250 or so. Oh, yeah, here's the Quadrox. Um, so I spent a lot of time on that drawing on the right. I know it looks like a blind, like second grader did it, but it took me a long time. Um, what's important about this here is that if you took, if you were some sadistic psychopath and cut someone's lungs open and stretched out all your alveoli and decided to lay it on your closest tennis court, it would be around half the size of an entire tennis court, 50 to 70 side meters squared. The surface area of the quadrox is around 1.8 meters squared, as we learned a minute ago. So on the right, you have the blue area is your surface area of your lungs, and in the tiny bottom right-hand corner is going to be the surface area of the quadrox oxygenator. I think it's just kind of impressive to see that the quadrox is that efficient. It's a pretty good piece of technology. So once we've decided which of our circuits we're going to use, we need to talk about cannulas. Um, and here, this surgeon here is, has to play operation and, and beat it three times before he can actually work on his patient that's awake. So when we talk about cannula selection, the big thing that comes to my head from a perfusionist standpoint is something called pressure drop. For those of you that don't know what pressure drop is, it's the difference between the fluid entering and leaving the cannulas. It shows resistance. Um, the greater the pressure drop, the greater the resistance. My brother and I were younger, we would have water balloon fights. And whenever we finished the water balloon fights and one person had a couple of water balloons left, the other person would run to the water hose. And you'd go and you'd crank the water hose up and I would just squirt it at my brother. And whenever he ran out of balloons, he would run over the water hose and instead of just holding it like this, he would stick his thumb over it. And my brother was three years older than me, but at that point he understood flow and pressure dynamics more than I did. And he knew that by including part of the, the outflow, it's going to make it go farther and harder. So it took me a while to get that until I went to the shed and got my dad's pressure washer. And at that point, we were even. Um, so all of the cannula companies know that we like pressure drop. It gets us all hot and bothered. So what they do is they provide us, with all their cannulas, pressure drops. What they do, though, is they run all of theirs in water. It's convenient, it's easy, it's also a Newtonian solution, which is just fancy, meaning there's not a bunch of stuff in it. Blood, on the other hand, is non-Newtonian. It's got platelets, it's got hemoglobin, it's got white cells, it's got albumin. It'd be really hard to replicate that over and over and over and over and over in a lab, especially because everybody's different. So if you look and see that the viscosity of blood is around four to five times thicker than water. So you've got to take this into consideration when you're looking at these pressure drops that they provide for us. So one of our big go-to cannulas, as everyone knows here, is the Avalon. It's bicaval, it's really convenient, it's nice, it reduces your risk of recirculation in patients, they can walk, it's radio opaque so you can see it under the C-arm, and it comes in a variety of sizes. Um, if you've never used the, car, the, the uh, Avalon here, I've got a video, I don't know if this video is going to work or not, we'll see, I think Saraf messed up the... Um, yeah, okay. Oh, well, that's a really cool video. If you go to the website youtube.com and type in the uh, Avalon cannula, it'll come up. It's a neat little two-minute presentation of how the cannula works. I highly recommend it. It's very informative. So this is the pressure drop that the nice people at McKay provide for the uh, Avalon cannula. What's important to look here on this guy is, uh, I don't know, like, laser, laser plan. Okay, so... Most people say that an acceptable pressure drop is around 100 millimeters of mercury, give or take. So let's say here at UAB we have a 31 French Avalon, which is what Daniel wants when he uh, passes out. If you look here at about 100 millimeters of mercury, give or take, and you come down here, you're somewhere around four liters of flow. I know from pretty good experience you're going to get about four and a half liters on the 31 French Avalon before you start hitting some pretty high resistance. 
But what's more important, I think, from the arterial side is the venous. There's very little places in your body, possibly none, that really are succumbed to negative pressures. Your red blood cells are used to being pushed through the capillaries and they even have that weird bicable disc looking thing that makes it convenient and easy for them. But nowhere in their body are you supposed to be sucked up like a vacuum. So I think the red cells can take about positive 2,000 millimeters of mercury before they start to hemolyze versus around negative 200 of pressure before they start to hemolyze. So we try and keep our line pressures here around negative 100 on the venous side. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If we don't decide to use the Avalons here, generally our go-to next is the Biomedicus cannulas. This is gonna be more of your traditional VA cannulas that you get a femoral and an arterial versus a venous cannula as well. Only big difference between them, which I got a picture here in a second, I'll show you the size reference, is in the kits is the guide wires. The arterial guide wire is gonna be around 100 centimeters versus the venous around 180. So if you've got a, sur a, cannula, a, a surgeon that's not good at cannulating and they keep messing up the guide wires after guide wire after guide wire after guide wire, understand that all they just need is a guide wire and you can pick, go to your nearest cath lab and pick out one of these two. Um, or bring a bunch of extras if you're used to specific people. Okay, so this is the Biomedicus femoral cannula and the uh, arterial and the venous. Arterial is on top, venous is on the bottom. Venous is just really long. These are also the Biomedicus pressure drops that they provided for us. Here they're nice enough to say that flow rates in liters per minute of water at room temperature. So take it with a grain of salt, but it's nice to know the flows when you're trying to figure out does your giant patient need small cannulas? Probably not, but if they're morbidly obese and they have tiny vasculature, then maybe so. So we've got our circuits figured out, we've got our cannulas picked out. Now we're gonna have this patient on ECMO and we're gonna draw some labs on him. Um, this guy, uh, he farted, that's the joke. Um, okay, so our basic labs here, renal function, as we've all talked, the kidneys are, they have the highest critical closing pressure of all your organs. They're the first to jump ship when it gets going rough and watery. So if your patient's still making good urine, if you've got good BUN and creatinine, you're probably in a pretty good shape. Liver enzymes, as we talked about, when your cannula goes into your liver, or if you have a patient that was uh, alcoholic for a while and got put on ECMO, you're gonna have some pretty crazy liver enzymes. The LDH here we use a lot for cell death, cell lysis. There's like five different types of LDH that you can get. We use it to see if the circuit's clotting off, if there's a lot of hemolysis in the circuit, or if the patient is doing okay and it's really not the circuit's problem. In addition to that, we also have our plasma-free hemoglobin level that we'll use for hemolysis as well. So by no means do we just use one definitive lab for stuff. From a coagulation standpoint, we're gonna draw most of your basic coags. Sometimes we'll draw an anti 10 I know that's really big in the, the children's world and Joey's life and whatnot. They do a lot more anti 10 -As. If we have a patient who's not responding well to heparin therapy, we'll draw an AT3 level. They might just need a little bit of uh, FFP to get them over that hump. But if you do give them FFP and they're on a really high heparin level, don't be shocked if they start bleeding a lot because you might have just poked the bear too much. All right, from an anticoagulation standpoint, in the OR, the ACT is the gold standard. And we used to do ACTs all the time. But the ACT is just one test that tests for one thing. We'll do PTTs sometimes, once again, anti 10 As. A lot of our big go to these days is the thromboelastograph or the TEG. This guy is a global overall picture of how well the patient's doing from a coagulation standpoint. So you've got five different tests that's going on here in the TEG. And what the TEG does on the right over here is you put some blood in it and it starts to oscillate back and forth, and this little pin here, once it starts to get stuck in the blood, it starts to make a little, a beautiful graph for you. I know this little oscillates back and forth, back and forth. So with the tag, we have first is our R time. This is the one that we use for ECMO for the most part, for heparin. This is gonna be the time that it takes the start of the test to the first part of the clot. We try and keep our R times around two to three times 
the baseline. So we'll draw two tests, one that is the current patient and one that has heparinase in it that gets rid of the heparin. So it kind of pretends like the patient's not on heparin at all and we'll compare the two of them. Next you have your K time. This is the time that it takes for the clot to reach the fixed strength, which is 20 millimeters. Um, both the uh, K time and the alpha angle are impacted by your fibrinogen level. So if these are low, you can treat them with cryo. If your R time's short and you want it to be long, give them heparin. If it's too long and you don't want it to be long, give them FFP. Our MA is gonna be the highest amplitude of the test. This is impacted by your platelets. So if it's really narrow, you probably wanna give more platelets. We can have patients that have been post-cardiotomy that have a platelet count of 400,000, but the platelets are so cold they don't actually work. So you have this platelet count of 400,000 that looks great on number-wise, and then you draw a tag and it's this really narrow MA because the platelets aren't doing anything. The last one's gonna be your lice 30. This is once you've reached that MA, how much of the amplitude reduction after 30 minutes. This is gonna show if you have fibrinolysis prematurely, such as maybe you need some Amicar to treat the anti-fibrinolysis. So there's a bunch of words. Here's a picture, I think a picture's worth a thousand words. This is pretty much what I just said. You've got your R time, K, alpha angle. Your MA is gonna be this guy right here. And then your lice 30 is right over here. I don't know if Matt Tyndall's here. Matt's our, uh, our go-to tag guy. So if you see him tomorrow, he's got gorgeous gray locks. Um, he'll, he'll talk to you about tags until you want to pass out. Here's some different types of tags you might see in the real world. You got your normal coagulopathic, reduced platelet, primary fibrinolysis, hypercoagulable DIC and DIC stage two. So take a look at those. Okay, so we've got our labs, our patient's doing great, but now it's time for emergency mode. Um, with emergencies, communications is so important, as Daniel talked about a minute ago. We do have two types of emergencies here at UAB. Um, we have the one that works well and the one that is a giant cluster. For our protocols, though, we have two prime circuits, good for about 30 days each primed. On top of those circuits, we have an ECMO changeout tray that contains clamps and scissors so that we have enough sterile instruments. In addition, we've made these changeout packs that have drapes, gowns, gloves, Dura Prep, and OR towels. The last thing you want to do in a changeout is try and find all this stuff. If you go and ask your nearest nurse or somebody, hey, go find me these five things, they're going to go, huh? And they're going to come back 10 minutes later with a bunch of friends. So we've made it convenient for ourselves. We also have two ECMO carts. We go and do a lot of cannulations outside of the CICU. So these are really nice portable carts that have supplies in them. Um, we've waited a long time for a simple thing such as a C-arm cover. Because that unit doesn't do a lot of uh, portable C-arms, so they don't have a C-arm cover. And we're all waiting around with this patient who's decompensating for a C-arm cover because we don't want to jeopardize the sterile field. So we carry some stuff now. So if we're doing our job right, and we know the patient's doing okay, and we can do a planned oxygenator change out. This is, this is the best plan. We've got two people scrubbed in. A lot of times it's gonna be a nurse and a perfusionist, or a doctor and a nurse, or a doctor and a perfusionist. We're gonna have the intensivists and the nurse practitioners at bedside. We're gonna establish a sterile field, have a ton of code drugs available. If the patient's intubated, it'd be nice if we could turn their FI2 up to 100%. Fun part about this game is if it's a VV patient and their lungs don't work, then you're kind of just beating a dead horse there. But at least you said you did it. Well, then we're gonna clamp out the new circuit, place some 3.8s, 3.8s connectors in the new circuit, test it out to make sure everything's going the right way. Then we're gonna clamp out the old circuit, cut the lines, establish a new contection, and make sure the flow is working. We're gonna check for color change because sometimes you forget to turn the gas on the new circuit and you can't figure out why well, your blood's real dark. So check for color change, flow, and then secure the new cannulas. That's ideal. From the time that you have that patient clamped out to the time that they're back on ECMO, we can generally do around 30 seconds to a minute when it's organized. When it's unorganized, though, it's a totally different story. First, clamp out the old circuit, especially if there's an air embolism present. Um, you don't want to hand crank an air embolism. Next, we're going to call for help. 
determine the air source and stop it if possible. If it's a central line that's been opened by accident, turn the stop clock back, please, because all you're going to do is keep introducing air, and then you're going to introduce air into your new circuit, and then you're going to introduce air into your new circuit after that one. Once again, increase the FiO2, give some sedation, give some code drugs. There might code, there might be a little bit of CPR going on. We're going to then do all of the new stuff that we did earlier, establish the field, bring in the new circuit, clamp it out, add connectors, establish the connection, resume ECMO, and then lastly, you're going to change your pants. Um, these are stressful. Um, they're a lot of times disorganized, a lot of times they're in the middle of the night, and there's you and two or three people. And it requires a lot of communication very fast. 